Hello everyone. It's actually a little bit intimidating, daunting to be following a Nobel laureate and then a letter from Vijay Raghavan. But on the other hand, um, I hope that the subject matter that I have to talk to you about will be of interest to you. The, my, and, and besides the exhibition that is out there, it's really going to take you through a very important period in the history of India and a very, very important contribution that India has made to the larger world in terms of botanical medical knowledge. And so I'm not only, I'm not going to go through all of the content of the exhibition, but I'm going to mostly talk about two aspects of this work that has actually fascinated me. My own encounter with uh, this material came quite accidentally actually once in Cambridge when I was at, uh, at one of the libraries in Cambridge when in my usual habit I was browsing through some of the old books in Cambridge library and I came across a book about four inches thick called The Great Herb Book. And while I was looking through it, there, you know, as fate would have it, as we believe in India, I opened the volume to a page that shows a picture of the Indian ficus tree, ficus bengalensis. I couldn't believe that this, six, this Elizabethan herbal would have a picture of this, uh, of this very recognizable, very recognizable image of a ficus tree. So of course I took the time to page through the book and I found that there were 200 or so images of Indian plants in this Elizabethan herbal with very accurate descriptions of their, med of their properties, some of them medicinal, some of them decorative, and so on. And the author, John Gerard, uh, says in the introduction that he collected this information from what was actually circulating in Europe at the time. He had never been to India. He said that the knowledge came to him from uh, somewhere in the Middle East through uh, um, Syria, of course, Aleppo, which are poor, you know, unfortunately we hear too much about Aleppo in very adverse circumstances, to Paris. And from Paris, John Robin sent all this information to him to London. I mean, as you can imagine, I was totally fascinated. So over time, I took time to sort of browse through these volumes. And as Jitu said, at some point I decided I'm actually more interested in this than in running a microscopy facility in the Beckman Center in Stanford. So I left. So, so that's how I began on this, uh, on this work. But what I want to actually make two points um, only in this talk, and first and foremost it is my um, own sense of how much of this knowledge, which actually the, the, the University of Chicago um, historian uh, who wrote the somewhat interesting title, Asia in the Making of Europe, talks about the European experience of coming to India, and he says the remarkable story of knowledge the Europeans encountered in India was often hidden behind the, 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 the daring of European voyages of discovery. So I thought it was time to look at what forced the Europeans to embark on these daring voyages of discovery. So I went, but before I get off of the story, I want to thank uh, the designers of this exhibition. I have very good fortune to work with a enormously talented and incredibly uh, dedicated group of people, and I hope some of them are here. I don't think this could be, have happened without them. And I really, really want to thank them for all the hours they have put into this work and the imaginative and, and the beautiful way in which they executed this exhibition. While the content is mine, the display, and the way the organization and the arrangement is entirely mine, entirely theirs, and I have no part in it. So I want to give them the credit. And also, before I move on, I want to, of course, um, thank um, Jitu for inviting me to do this, and also Avarna Banerjee, who put an enormous amount of work behind the scenes to make this happen. And of course, Mr. Sahadevan, who, as I said in a I think to him by waving his magic wand can dis make obstacles disappear. And the marvelous architecture team who helps us to set up, do the setting up, um, and also instrumentation and administrative team here at the NCBS. You know, Sarita Sundar, who worked on the early part of this, you know, this ideation with us, and also uh, Bharat Joshi, who was actually 
um, interacting with the design team. And lastly, I want to express my enormous gratitude to museums and collections all over the world, St. Petersburg Library to, to uh, you know, the American uh, Institute, to the British Library and all those uh, very, very learned and very, you know, tremendous institutions that have tremendous collections who generously shared, you know, images and material. Now, the theme of this exhibition really that I wanted to really focus on is that societies need to construct a past or rather there are many paths for past as a social function. And in this case, the social function I want to really look at is the fact that even though in modern terms we think of science as being a product of experiments run in the laboratory, scientific knowledge was actually, you know, if you define scientific knowledge as, as knowledge accumulated by trial and error, ha was actually part of all ancient societies and that is especially true of the botanical medical traditions of India. So I want to start with this map. And this map shows what was the most important uh, you know, uh, the trade routes of the ancient world. So all of the information that I'm going to show you have been collected from documents and maps and other things of the period. So this is a map that I actually modified from the Dunhuang project. Um, but it shows that the western part of India and northwest part of India was actually the focus of land routes as well as uh, marine routes during the you know, early trading activities of the world. This is all, almost dated to sort of the first century. And what were the trading items that were involved in trade? Natural products of India. Some of them, I mean, the spices and medicines were the primary components of India trade. Then uh, dyes, mordants, and textiles. Which were, which, also, which were actually the products of very sophisticated technology. And we are going to go there in a minute. So the, the, the one document I am going to bring to your attention is this very, very important document called the Mysuris Papyrus. Many of you have, may have heard about it. It is dated to the second century AD. It, was, um, it is now in the Vienna Library. And they were very kind to share me high resolution views of these fragments. So what it is, is a trade agreement between two merchants from the Middle East who were in Mussoorus. And this Mussoorus papyrus, uh, you can see on the, the, on the left side, you can see that it's, it, it's written in Greek. So one side of the papyrus uh, talks about the contents, the other side of the papyrus talks about the cost of the materials involved. And what the three major ingredients in the shipment of this papyrus, in, in, in this shipment that is recorded on the papyrus, one was Ganget Ignard, yes. Um, so so what was, why was it so important? It had very, very important medicinal properties. The oil from the rhizome is used as a sedative uh, and to f fight insomnia, and it's also used in perfumes and also in unguents and in ritual worship in uh, you know, ceremonies in the, in the Middle East and beyond. So, but here we go. We know that we have, in, in India, there was a very, very ancient tradition of knowledge of um, medicinal as well as, you know, as well as agricultural plants. This reference from the Rig Veda talks about the fact that herbs are the firstborn of the gods. Because of their healing properties, they, they are assigned divine qualities almost. So that the ability of plants to heal complex diseases was actually known in, in very interesting ways in India almost 4,000 years ago or more. If my calculation is right, I just did it quickly in my head. But, and then, but the other, uh, sta the second stanza says, he who has knowledge of the herbs, he is a very revered individual in, in Indian society, but I notice the healer is a demon killer and a plague dispeller. Another reference like to the nard of the psychoactive properties of many of the Indian medicines. This comes over and over again, and we will, I will point that out as we go along. So, so we already um, realized that sophisticated knowledge about the medicinal properties of plants existed in India for a very, very long time. Now the second item, which was very highly valued in this Masoret papyrus, was dyed textiles, dyed cloth. We know that in India we have a very special uh, um, variety of cotton which spins very, very fine filaments 
that Pliny the Elder called the woven winds of India. In fact, Pliny complained that the ladies of Rome didn't wear enough of those, so it, because they were so fine. Okay? But, but what was appreciated beyond the fact that they were fine is that they, were, they could be dyed with indigo, and that the dyeing process with, that gave this fast blue color was something that was almost exclusive to India uh, almost into the 18th century. Now, this image uh, from the British Library actually is a 19th century um, you know, company painting which just shows the stages of indigo dyeing. But on the right side, I have a formula from a paper that was published in Nature in 1900 which shows the complex chemistry that is behind the, you know, the extraction of indigo from indigo plant. So to, to quickly summarize it, the fresh leaves of indigo are ground in water and the supernatant is clear. And then uh, it, it has no dyeing properties at all. So then what happens is, the, it is so that uh, what is extracted is indican. Indican is then um, uh, allowed, to f allowed to ferment, simply incubate for about 12 hours and an enzyme from the leaf that is released then converts indican to indoxyl. And then overnight, the indoxyl is very rapidly, vigorously stirred. In the process, oxidation takes place. And the indigo then precipitates out a solution. It is blue, and then it's pressed into cakes. And then that's not the end of it, because the cellulose fiber of the cotton has then has to be adequately prepared in other ways to be able to bind the indigo, uh, the active indigo dye to the cotton fiber. So this complex process was worked out in India very, very long time ago. So when we talk about knowledge and chemistry, and when we talk about science, so we have to ask the question, is science always the one that is done in the laboratory? Empirical knowledge such as this, with, with, that underlie, uh, with very complex you know, principles underlying it, was very, very much part of ancient societies. And that is particularly true for the you know, um, botanical medical knowledge systems of India. So, of course, um, since I'm watching my clock, <laughs> um, what happens, of course, is that by the time, by the end of the 15th century, the commodities from India, which had gone, which go, went from India to the Middle East, and from the Middle East to Venice or Genoa, and from there was sent to different parts of the of Europe, had become so costly for people, you know, countries at the end of the supply chain which was Portugal and Spain. So Portugal and Spain then compete with each other to find a direct route to, to the markets of India to acquire the commodities directly and cut out the other merchants. So here, the search for a direct route to India to acquire Indian commodities based on the, no the, the commodities based on the knowledge systems of India. The uses of the commodities were actually developed by the knowledge systems of India. That was the driving force behind the voyages of discovery that profoundly changed the map of the world and the history of the world. So this is one point that I want to leave with you, that, that, the, that the history of the world was profoundly changed by the need to acquire the materials, the materials from India, which were actually the products of you know, years and years of experimentation you know, by communities all, all across the you know, uh, levels of Indian society. So then what happens, of course, is that as shortly after Europeans arrive in India, they realize that they were not equipped to deal with the diseases in the tropics. And of course, uh, if you read the text, it's very, very graphic. They say that Portug Portugalese only have letting of blood, but the Indians and the, Indians and the heathens cured themselves with herbs. So basically, suddenly, there is a search for knowledge about the herbal medicines of India and very large numbers of very interesting and detailed works on Indian medicines were prepared by scholar physicians of the Portuguese and the Dutch, and we have a wealth of literature. And the last exhibition that I did last you know, here, in collaboration with Sarita Sundar, of course, focused on the Hortus Malabaricus, which was one of the masterpieces of you know, uh, pre linnean botanical knowledge. So these are just showing that some of the books that were uh, you know, actually put together by the Europeans uh, in order to be able to record Indian medical knowledge for their survival, not only in India, but in the tropical colonies, in, in, in other places, 
in Africa as well as in the Americas. So this large body of information was actually collected by Europeans. Now, when the British actually come to India, and they, um, there was even a more determined effort to acquire botanical medical knowledge systems of India. And you can see, this is just a few of the, of the works that were published. And you can see from the title that you know, they have to do with you know, um, not only cottons and other you know, commodities that they could use, but they were, they're, they're, there are books on the antiquity of Indi, in, in, you know, Hindu medicine. Oops. And there are books on the material medica of India. And these were mostly done by physicians and who were involved in, you know, who were working with the British East India Company. But the first of a series of these works was actually published at the end of the 17th century. End of the 17th century, there were a series of seven papers which were published in the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society, which were sent from a physician who was living in in Madras at the time and working at the, at Fort St George. But James Pettiver, who was a fellow of the Royal Society, who submitted the paper to the Royal to the Philosophical Transactions, says that these medicines are amazing. But he makes a special point to point out that these medicines are very good for diseases of the mind, convulsive disorders, insomnia, and so on. So there is again and again an emphasis, which is something that interests me. That's for another, um, another uh, period and, and a, you know, another study. So, but, so, then, so where does this leave us? So we have this very large volumes of material, and that could be of great interest. And you know, I know that Darshan Shankar and the FRLHD is doing a marvelous job, have done a marvelous job over the years of documenting, you know, folk medical knowledge of India. And of course, many of this will, of course, hopefully lead to, you know, very profitable results in the long run. I mean, profitable, I don't mean money-wise, but I mean, you know, result-wise. But what is interesting about these European books is that these are med medical knowledge systems which the Europeans collected from regional materia medica of all the various parts of India. So in that sense, this is different from the knowledge systems which are uh, documented in the Ayurvedic texts. The other um, very interesting aspect of this, these, these volumes is that they um, also were skeptical when they first arrived in India. You can also read in, in, the, in the introduction to these books about some of the comments about some of the practices of medicine. And nevertheless, within 100 years, they become dependent on indigenous medicine. So therefore, a certain amount of scrutiny was exercised in accumulating this information. And the other more important, and probably the most important, is that these books record the medicinal properties of single medicinal plants, as opposed to formulations, which immediately gives you an edge on if you wanted to take it further in a different direction. So next, so then we have this very, very large body of literature, which I actually have not seen referred to very much at all. And so what shall we do with all this? That could be other very, very useful information. Well, it's molecular understanding of the vast array of traditional med medicines of India in use for centuries in India and the world over still remains to be, you know, elucidated. So with the, is there a, is there a room for the re-emergence of natural products as a source for drug discovery, you know, with tools of the genomic era? This is a question for the scientists in the audience. And lastly, uh, there are, of course, I could t talk on and on about all the different reasons for looking at traditional medical knowledge systems for for um, you know, experimentation, but some of them are really very convincing. One is that natural products, especially plant extracts, have an exp they have exceptional chemical diversity of natural products and provide a variety of lead structures against molecular targets. Okay. Many of these cannot be synthesized, and of course all of you know that the success rate of synthetic libraries uh, to give you know, active molecules which actually can be transferred from mouse models to humans. There have been spectacular failures in the recent past. In fact, I can list three of them for you right now. One was Sanofi, which had actually spent hundreds of million dollars, and in the final process, the toxicity of the, of the compound made uh, Sanofi withdraw the product, okay? 
And the other is that, so what I am sort of hoping that I would provoke the interest in all of you, or some of you, to actually start thinking about how to bring together a consortium where we can actually use the traditional medical knowledge that was rec recorded in these volumes that I just passed by you. Okay? And one of the very important aspects of doing this type of work maybe, and Darshan of course who has a great deal of inf infl I mean, great experience with this actually can comment on this later maybe, one of the first places to begin maybe to start with a focused st study, so focused search you know, directed at specific diseases. And, and then uh, search through informa the information in these, in these um, traditional uh, knowledge books from the Europeans and compare them with medicinal plants used in, in other geographical areas with similar conditions, like in the tropical areas of Africa, for example, and the Americas. And then um, it's also very important that natural product researchers from different parts of the world cooperate because all of these are promising but tremendously complex issues. And so, and lastly, it's very important to realize that some of the prejudices we have about uh, finding drug targets that are single molecules probably have to be changed because in many cases some of these products, some of these medicines probably interact with synergistic activity. In fact, there is a wonderful example of pepper you know, piperine in black pepper, which has, which uh, probably has one of the main functions of piperine, maybe is that when piperine binds to the microvilli, of, in the intestinal microvilli, it actually makes the uptake of molecules that are otherwise difficult to be taken in. So there is really many complex issues, but also there are many, 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 you know, promising opportunities. And what I would be really interested, so you say that you know, so the alkaloid piperine enhances the bioavailability of other molecules. And that lastly, one of the very interesting aspects of this work that I, that I have in the, in, the, in the exhibition at the very end, uh, we find that, we find that um, uh, some of the folk tales, which are part of traditional medicine, are tremendous resources uh, for, yeah, can you just put it back to where it was? tremendous resources, and, uh, and we have illustrated two stories. One, um, I, since I have two minutes, I, I will take the time to tell you. In one, of, in one of my interviews, I was talking with a very old Kerala physician, a Natuvaidin, a folk physician, and he was telling me about one of the things that I'm very interested in for one, for one reason or another, are diseases of the mind. Like it says in the Rig Veda, you know, the demon killers. Yeah. So he was telling me, yes, yes, he has a very big medicine, very, very important medicine. And he said, well, but I don't use it anymore. And I said, why? Because he said, oh, I'm too old. I said, why? He said, well, the medicine has to be collected by a naked man. Uh, but it's an ithika need, say a parasite plant. And he said, you know, I'm too old to climb a tree at night. And it seems on the surface a ridiculous story, right? But when you think about it from the point of view of plant biology, we realize that secondary metabolites, small molecules in plants, vary significantly with external conditions. So is it possible that this powerful uh, parasitic plant may either express the active molecule at a very high concentration, at low light and low temperature conditions in the tropics, or is it possible that may be an inhibitor of the activity of the active ingredient is probably modulated? These are the type of questions I think we need to ask. And I think, I, I hope I interest some of you at least in thinking about this type of, uh, you know, this, because we have a very vast resource of traditional knowledge, especially in these European books that I have, uh, you know, presented in, in this exhibit. And, and during, the, and during the break, if anybody wants me to walk with you through the exhibition, there is a tremendous amount more material that, you know, historic, uh, at, you know, uh, representations of India in, in European art, all of those type of things that are really quite stimulating, at least for me, and I would really be very excited to share it with you. Thank you. <laughs>